Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. It has been our endeavor at Baiju's to help and support IAS aspirants at every stage of their preparation. Now, when we are expecting IAS mains examination 2021 results by fourth week of March, and aspirants are gearing up for the last leg of this prestigious examination that is personality test, we are back again to assist them forming an insight and opinion about multiple issues and topics concerning our great nation and its body polity. Like last year, we have meticulously curated a special series of talks and lectures to help our would-be steel pillars of this nation. In this special series of talk, we invite the stalwarts of our nation, renowned personalities, eminent civil servants, intellectuals, foreign policy experts, and academicians to address the young minds of UPSC civil services examination and guide them by sharing their views on significant topics chosen carefully from various spheres of knowledge, such as India's foreign policy, Indian economy, our judicial system, ecology and environment, etc. The purpose of this special series is to enable those students who are appearing for their personality test to have an opinion, to have an insight, to have a viewpoint, to have a holistic approach towards contemporary issues and they can maximize their score. When we started this series last year, we have received overwhelming response from students in general and those preparing for their personality test in particular. This series will help you to give finishing touches and to make you ready and provide you with pragmatic insights so that in your actual interviews in front of UPSC board, you can give your best, you can articulate your viewpoints in a very designed way and you can maximize your score. Today we are joined by a very distinguished diplomat, former IFS officer, Mr. Rakesh Sood. Mr. Sood has served as India's ambassador to Afghanistan, Nepal and France. Sir was ambassador and permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. He has also served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Embassy of India in Washington, D.C. In 2013, Mr. Sood was appointed Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. He set up the Disarmament and International Security Affairs Division in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in India. At present, Sir is a Distinguished Fellow at ORF Observer Research Foundation. Thank you, sir. We are really privileged to have you in our series. Thank you. Sir, when students, they go for UPSC interview, uh, there are lots of questions on foreign policy issues, uh, India's threats, India's nuclear policy. And this topic becomes all the more important because of the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. So, sir, let us start with the kind of volatility we are witnessing in global order and perceived threat to India. What are the main features of India's nuclear doctrine? India's nuclear doctrine has to be seen not as a standalone policy, but as an integral part of our security strategy, and which is also linked in many ways to how India perceives itself in the region, in the wider neighborhood, and on the global stage. We have never been an expansionist power. We have never sought to build empires through conquest. In fact, India is quite singular in the fact that its uh, foreign policy has been guided by a Vasudev Katumbakam approach. We have sought to share knowledge, share the values that our civilization possesses, because after all, it is an unbroken civilization for thousands of years. 
and we have sought to gain from peaceful coexistence in our neighborhood and in the region as a whole. There was a lot of thought given when India went openly nuclear in 1998 after the series of nuclear tests that were carried out in May of 1998. And the elements of our nuclear doctrine that were pronounced at that point in time under Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee have remained reasonably sound and have stood the test of time. Among these elements was the idea of a credible minimum doctrine that our deterrent has to be both minimalistic as well as a credible nuclear deterrent. That remains so even today. The reason was that we did not want to get drawn into a nuclear arms race with any other country, be it Pakistan or be it China. A second element that was an integral part of India's nuclear doctrine was the idea of a no first use, that India will not be the first to initiate the use of nuclear weapons in any form of conflict. This is linked to the fact of the role that we attributed to our nuclear deterrent. In other words, we did not consider India's nuclear deterrent to be the solution to all of India's security challenges but to prevent the threat or use of nuclear weapons by an adversary against India. So therefore it was linked to a limited purpose or what is normally called sole purpose in terms of the role of nuclear weapons and a no first use to buttress this. These are factors that have remained in order to give greater credibility to our deterrent, we also announced that we would have a triad. A triad would mean land-based missiles, bombs carried by long-distance aircraft, as well as submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The third leg of the triad is something that has been in the making and we are now reaching a stage where we can have our own SLBMs with an adequate range. This will then constitute and meet the requirements that were spelt out in 1998. Thank you, sir. Sir, if you look at uh, Ukraine-Russia war, Russia is threatening using nuclear weapons against Ukraine. Russian foreign minister says that there is a possibility of third world war and it will be led by nuclear weapons. On the other side, Ukraine lamenting its decision of abandoning nuclear weapons. So a question comes, sir, do nuclear weapons necessarily guarantee security? The Russian decision to announce placing its nuclear weapons in a special combat status readiness was something that was intended more for NATO forces because before that there had been some statements coming out of individual NATO countries that there could be perhaps some citizens belonging to NATO countries who might go to fight Russia in Ukraine. In that sense, those countries could also become combatants because if their citizens are involved, then to that extent that country becomes a combatant. Otherwise, they would be acting as mercenaries, which under international law is normally not done in this kind of a conflict. Regarding Ukraine and their president's speech that you referred to, he spoke, I think, uh, in the month of February in uh, Munich at the Munich Security Conference. And there he uh, wondered aloud whether uh, Ukraine had done the right thing in 1994 when it uh, signed the Budapest Memorandum under which it gave up the nuclear weapons that were on its territory. Mind you, 
these were not Ukraine's nuclear weapons, because at that time, Ukraine was a part of Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, namely USSR. So these were Soviet nuclear weapons deployed in Ukraine, and there were quite a few of them, nearly 5,000 according to certain estimates. Ukraine also had other nuclear-related infrastructure on its territory. However, once Soviet Union had broken up and it had become now 15 republics, out of which Russia was seen as the successor state, there was a convergence of interests that Ukraine and also Kazakhstan and Belarus, because these two countries also had certain nuclear weapons and nuclear facilities, that these countries should be denuclearized. There was, this was a view that was held both by United States as well as Russia and the other nuclear weapon states in the Security Council, the permanent five permanent members, which includes China, UK and France. Hence, there was uh, an employment of all means of persuasion with Ukraine, including financial incentives as well as security guarantees to persuade Ukraine to give up its nuclear weapons, which it did. And I think that uh, it is that decision that President Zelensky was talking about. Now, as to the second part of your question, that do nuclear weapons guarantee security? Well, in some fashion you can feel that they perhaps do, but yet it is important to remember that ultimately it is a question of the role that you attribute to nuclear weapons. Let me take this one step further. Even if Ukraine had a limited nuclear arsenal that it possessed, would it want to get into a nuclear war with Russia? I would think not. Would it perhaps deter Russia from a border in incursion in the eastern part of Ukraine? Perhaps not. So therefore, a lot depends on what the nuclear weapons are designed for, what is the doctrine, and how is deterrence going to be applied in that particular equation. So far, we have seen nuclear weapons used only once in 1945. That experience of their destructiveness was such that the world came to the conclusion that it is best if these weapons are never used again. And I would like to believe that that is the direction in which nuclear weapon states need to design their policies. And that is why I think India's policy of no first use was an extremely valid policy. Great. Thank you, sir. That means nuclear weapons itself, they do not guarantee security. There are different aspects as well. Great, sir. Sir, new uncer uncertainties surround the outcome of the war in Ukraine. The question is, will Russia or Russian President Vladimir Putin will further tighten military presence or pressure? or Russia will accept assurances from Ukrainian neutrality. But in any case, sir, nuclear weapons are here to stay. And the topic of disarmament, non-proliferation, they have taken back seat. How to tackle these uncertainties? Or do you think it will further arms race, particularly nuclear weapons uh, race among other countries? I think that countries that have had nuclear weapons for a long time, and by this, I mean certainly the United States and it was then Soviet Union and today, the, uh, today Russia. And then, of course, there are uh, three other countries, uh, UK, France and China. Uh, China tested in 1964. So these, you can, in some ways, you can say are the five oldest nuclear weapon states that we have. Then, of course, there have been other countries that have joined this group, 
Israel is widely believed to have nuclear weapons, though they don't declare it publicly. India and Pakistan also have nuclear weapons and both of them announced that publicly in 1998. And in addition, we have North Korea, which has also carried out a series of tests in the previous decade, prior to that, in fact, in 2003 onwards. And uh, therefore, they possess a limited nuclear arsenal. There is talk about other countries developing the capability. It is understandable because after all, nuclear technology today is an old technology. It is more than 75 years old. If we look at the kind of computers that existed 50 years ago and look at the kind of computers that exist even in a mobile phone today, we realize the advances that have been made in technology. However, many countries that have the capability to develop nuclear weapons have taken a conscious decision not to do so because they have come to the conclusion that perhaps their security is better served by not having nuclear weapons. So, in many ways, the decision of whether to go nuclear or not is a political decision. Similarly, I would suggest that the nuclear arms race did not begin with the war in Ukraine. In fact, it predates it because even in recent years, let's say the last five or six years, we have seen a gradual deterioration in the relationship of the major powers between US and Russia. New strains have emerged in that relationship. Between US and China, new strains have emerged in that relationship. The arms race has been driven more by these strains and by the continuous research and development that has been taking place in this field. I think the developments in offensive cyber capabilities is a case in point. The developments in space-related capabilities is another case in point. Both these developments create what is called nuclear entanglements. In other words, they have the capacity to impact on nuclear command and control structures as well as deterrence theories. And that is why countries have expanded their R&D also in the field of nuclear weapons, trying to see if they can design more robust and more usable nuclear weapons. That is actually the secret of the nuclear arms race. Thank you, sir. Sir, nuclear disarmament or non-proliferation is a kind of global responsibility. But having nuclear weapons, is a kind of nationalistic uh, power. People or countries, they project it as something called nationalistic. Do you see conflict between the two, global responsibility and showing national caliber? Or how to strike a balance between the two? Nuclear weapons are unique in their capacity that this is a weapon whose role is best limited to that of a deterrent. In other words, it is a weapon that it is best not used. In that sense, it becomes a unique weapon. Now, knowledge at the same time, human knowledge, is something that cannot be restricted. One person's knowledge cannot remain the private preserve of only that person. It will eventually spread. That is the law of basic human knowledge. So therefore, what happens is that now that the nuclear weapons have been discovered, have been developed, and countries do possess them, a few countries that is, it is quite possible that other countries that feel threatened may also take decisions to acquire them. It is very possible, despite all the technology controls and restrictions that the world has in place, the non-proliferation regimes, the export controls through the nuclear suppliers group, and so many other kinds of uh, restrictions. Yet, 
if a country is so determined, it is possible that they will make all possible efforts, they will make necessary sacrifices if they think that their security lies with nuclear weapons. At the same time, it does not mean that that is necessarily the path to go. Now, this in turn imposes a certain responsibility on countries that possess nuclear weapons. In other words, they need to ensure and they need to bring out the fact that nuclear weapons is not a security solution, but it is also a responsibility in terms of not using them and in terms of committing to nuclear disarmament. In fact, this was the understanding that existed originally in the 1960s. However, the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that emerged through the process of negotiations in the 1960s, has been in a sense distorted and what was considered to be a special responsibility of the five old nuclear weapon states has been treated by them as a license to continue to hold their own nuclear weapons for all times to come while denying that to other countries. And that essentially is the tension or the contradiction in the existing global nuclear non-proliferation regime. Great. Thank you, sir. Sir, in one of your articles, you have talked about this third reordering of Europe, the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine. What does it mean, third reordering, and how will it impact India? Or how India can protect its own interest? Well, uh, I would say that uh, after World War II, there was a kind of uh, a European security order that came into being on the European continent. The reason was that the end of World War II was followed very quickly by the Cold War. Soviet Union and the United States were seen as the two nuclear superpowers. Each had their allies or satellite states. We saw two competing military alliances, NATO, led by the United States, which covered the Western European countries, and Warsaw Pact, led by USSR or Soviet Union, which covered Eastern Europe and USSR. Germany was divided. There was a division between East Germany, which was part of Warsaw Pact, and West Germany, which was part of NATO. So this was, I would say, around the middle of the 20th century, the first European security order that existed. It was a bipolar world. And the dividing line of the bipolar world ran through the continent of Europe. With the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and consequently the breakup of the Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact or the security alliance structure led by USSR, that disintegrated. As a result, we saw an approach towards a more unified Europe. The first unification that took place was that of Germany. East Germany and West Germany became a united Germany. There were many concerns among in the minds of many European countries on that score. Because remember, Germany has been in a sense responsible both for World War I as well as World War II. So there was a feeling perhaps that a unified Germany, which would be the strongest European power, given its size and economy, could once again go down the military path and become a military superpower in Europe. However, with the European Union taking on a more unified approach, with the introduction of a new currency called the Euro, Many of these concerns were sought to be allayed successfully, I dare say. And I think we have to give credit to the European leadership, especially the leadership in Germany 
and the leadership in France and other European countries at that point in time. So this became, in a sense, the second reordering of the European security landscape. This meant that when Russia invaded Ukraine directly using military force on 24th of uh, February, for the first time we saw after nearly 75 years a territorial aggression on the continent of Europe because so far for the last 75 years we had not seen that. With the second reordering, there was a feeling that perhaps Russia could also be a key stakeholder in the European security architecture. However, the gradual expansion of NATO by Western countries led to certain concerns in Moscow about NATO's intentions and what were clearly feeding into Russia's threat perceptions. Be that as it may, the Russian action has now ensured that irrespective of the outcome of the conflict in Ukraine, in the foreseeable future, Russia is unlikely to be a partner in Europe's security architecture that is going to come into play with, as this conflict concludes. We have seen a unification of NATO a rejuvenation of NATO. We have seen an admission of increased defense budgets by Western European countries. And this has created a new dividing line. And that is why I call it the third restructuring of the European security architecture, which has been catalyzed through this conflict in Ukraine. Great. Thank you, sir. And how will it impact India? Well, in a sense, it will have an impact on India because India has excellent relationships with the European Union as well as with the individual countries of Europe like France, like Germany and also um, UK, even though UK is no longer part of EU after the referendum. However, India also has excellent relationships with Russia. We have had traditionally good ties with Russia. Now clearly, if two of our partners are going to get into a relationship which is filled with tension and strain, to that extent it makes things difficult for us. So we will therefore have to manage our ties. We don't want to be in a situation where we have to choose between Russia or the European Union countries. Both are valuable partners as, as far as India is concerned. And therefore, we will have to walk that tightrope carefully in terms of ensuring that we can continue to engage in mutually beneficial partnerships despite the differences between Russia and the European countries. Great. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, coming back to human issues, uh, we are seeing that as Ukrainian crisis emerges, the world seems to have forgotten Afghanistan. And this has happened with Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, and other parts of this world. Now, how to tackle this multiple humanitarian crisis? Uh, because now India aspires to be not just a global superpower, but also a moral superpower. So do you find any dichotomy between the two or India can tackle it? I think earlier in the course of this uh, discussion, I spoke about the fact that India has a certain worldview. Now, whether India will emerge as a superpower or not is something that future will tell us. But certainly, India's leaders have always sought to place India in a role of an influencing country a country that can make positive contributions to the international law and order and international structures. From that point of view, India's worldview or India's philosophy provides it with a certain authority. But mind you, what we call soft power 
to be really meaningful, it has to be backed by hard power. And the hard power arises out of both internal political cohesion plus economy and plus military strength. So when you combine the values of soft power with the attributes of hard power, that is when we can say that India can make its voice felt. And then the contradiction that you referred to between the moral approach and the realist approach, that contradiction disappears. Great. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, there is a very hypothetical question. Like uh, a country which is a permanent member of United Nations Security Council wields very a uh, high role or power. So when can we expect India to be a part of that? Or is there any scope or not? You know, international institutions, once created, uh, often find it difficult to evolve with changing times. If we were to redo the United Nations today, in 2022, I'm quite sure that we will have a different set of permanent members. Maybe we will not even have permanent members of the UN Security Council today. Because given the a number of countries that have come into being, given the fact that we have seen that the Cold War that existed when uh, in 1945, which was coming into being at that time, which created the idea of permanent members of the Security Council and therefore made US, Soviet Union, China, UK and France as permanent members, which gave them certain privileges. Perhaps this idea of privilege need not even exist in today's United Nations. However, as I mentioned, because of the inertia, because of the lethargy, it becomes extremely difficult to modify that. For the last 30 years or so, since the end of the Cold War, the United Nations has been engaged in discussions about reforming the UN institutions, particularly the Security Council, the role of permanent members, the structure of permanent members, and their exercise of veto. However, this has not happened in more than 30 years. And today, with growing divergences among major powers, I do not think that there is any likelihood of the Charter of the United Nations actually being amended. Because today, with US and Russia having such a strained relationship, with US and China having such a strained relationship, no proposal by any single country will find acceptance among all the permanent members. And I think, therefore, we will have to wait for a long time till we are able to get convergence on some of these issues before there can be any expansion of the UN Security Council. Thank you, sir. Sir, before we wrap our discussion, you were India's ambassador to Nepal. Do you call this relationship a very uh, natural one today, or it is perceived that China is expanding its clout in Nepal. So quickly, if you could summarize what went wrong or how to mend that. Neighborhood relationships are always extremely sensitive and become even more sensitive when there is a wide disparity between the neighbors. Now, compared to India, Nepal is a much smaller country. And therefore, Nepal is very sensitive about issues like its sovereignty and so on. At the same time, it is also true that Chinese growth, economic growth in recent years has been quite remarkable. And China today is the second largest economy in the world. So if Chinese influence grows with the growth of its economy, that is a perfectly natural phenomena. Now, as Chinese influence grows, it will also grow in China's neighborhood, which includes South Asian countries and includes ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries. These would naturally be the first countries which would feel the growing Chinese influence. So to that extent, 
I would say it is natural. However, there are certain cultural, historical, religious and civilizational links between India and Nepal. And I think that with adequate sensitivity, we should be able to maintain a perfectly harmonious relationship between the two countries. Great. Thank you, sir. Sir, now lots of students, they give or they prefer IFS, Indian Foreign Service, as their main uh, career or um, cadre preference. So naturally, there are lots of questions from this area. What message would you like to give to um, uh, those students who are going for the interviews before UPSC? How to tackle questions from uh, such a wide and complex uh, uh, area that is foreign policy? And what, is, what would be your suggestion or message to them? I would say that first, I think the Indian Foreign Service is a great service because it gives you the privilege of representing a unique country like India. Second, I would say that when you go for an interview, perhaps there may be many aspects of Indian foreign policy about which you may be somewhat not fully informed. And I would think that it is best to acknowledge that because nobody would expect that going for an interview that you would be fully informed on all aspects of Indian foreign policy. So it is best to acknowledge where you feel that you are on unsure ground. Finally, I would say that foreign policy ultimately is something that has to create an environment for Indian political leaders to be able to fulfill the basic requirements that we have set out to have, which is a strong, economically developed India. So therefore, the role of foreign policy ultimately is to create an environment through our relationships in our neighborhood, our extended neighborhood, and with the major powers that will enable India to achieve these objectives and put India among the ranks of the most advanced, most developed, and at the same time, a country that is proud of its civilization and its values. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir, for being part of this series and sharing your valuable ideas, enlightening our students on different wide set of questions and topics that concerns India that will have impact not only on India, but on entire global community. Hopefully, this discussion will help students to have a holistic perspective and broader opinion base and viewpoint on few some of the burning topics that, that are expected to be asked in UPSC personality test. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir.